Welcome to another message from Columbus First Assembly. Thanks for listening as we strive to learn and live the Word and ways of God. Our hope is that you're encouraged by today's message. A boy loved to go to his grandmother's house. She loved him and encouraged him. And one day the boy was helping his grandmother in the garden when he stopped and he looked at her and he said, You know why I like coming over here all the time, Grandma? Whenever I'm around you, my heart feels full. Do you have anybody in your life like that? Whenever you're around them, your heart feels full. Have you ever had someone, maybe in a season of your life, be around you and, and you, you wanted to be around them because every time you were around them, they said something, they did something, and your heart felt full. I was a freshman in high school. Went to a different high school than I had went to an elementary school. Ninth grade's tough. Going to a new school in ninth grade's tougher. For me, being an insecure individual... It was toughest. Parent-teacher conference came around. They actually had parents come those times, and uh, parent-teacher conferences are, are differing now, but parent-teacher's conference came. I was, at, I was at home with my sisters, and my parents drove up to the school, and they went through the various classes that I was attending. And I had a class that was in music and art appreciation. The teacher of this class... I didn't know very well. But during the presentation that he gave to the parents who had students in his art and history, or his music and art appreciation class, he, uh, he had, he, our, our artwork was displayed, the little bit of art that we had done, and there was a collage that all of us had created and I would created, and he asked this question, he said, are the parents of Rick Glowacki here? And my parents hesitantly raised their hands and they said, I, I was so impressed when I saw what your son turned in. His collage showed and then he listed several things that it showed. And after my parents got home, they told me what this teacher had said about me and about my artwork and my heart felt full. As a matter of fact, that particular class became my favorite class. That particular teacher became my favorite teacher. Why? Because when I was around him, my heart felt full. This morning, I'm just going to talk a little bit about a God who enlarges hearts. I want you to experience a God who enlarges hearts because wouldn't it be great that we would feel of God what this little boy felt when he was around his grandmother. Wouldn't it be great that each and every one of us as God's children would be able to see, whenever I'm around you, God, my heart feels full. But unfortunately, I've been around long enough, I've experienced it myself, that I know that sometimes when we're around God, our heart doesn't feel full. Sometimes we we feel low. When we're around God. Here's the main point that I wish to communicate this morning. And hopefully everything will work towards it. But this. In your notes. Jesus is an uplifter. An inspirer. An encourager. And an affirmer. Jesus is an uplifter. An inspirer. An encourager. And an affirmer. He is not a deflator. Demoralizer. Or a discourager. That is not Jesus. Jesus is an uplifter. An inspirer. An encourager. And an affirmer. Jesus does not deflate, demoralize, or discourage. Yes, there are times when he corrects, times when he disciplines, times when he teaches and trains through negative circumstances, but at all times. He does it in a way that is designed to lift us up, to inspire us, to encourage, and to affirm. Jesus never will let you go through things. It's not his purpose Someone else's purpose, yes, we'll talk about that. It is not his purpose that you go through those circumstances so that he can beat you down, demoralize you, or discourage you. That is not his purpose. But unfortunately, way too many of us run into those type of circumstances. And so today, today, I want to talk to you about a God 
who enlarges hearts. I recently heard a man share a bit of his testimony. He got saved after he graduated from college. Actually, he had just finished graduate school. He grew up in a family where church attendance was about twice a year. He stated that the only time that he heard the name of Jesus Christ mentioned in his, heart, in his home was as an expletive. He said at this time of his life, just before he got saved, and he made this statement, and this is a statement that impacted me. He said, I was at a place where I thought that God was so disgusted with me for the way I was living that I didn't think I could come to him. I was at a place where I thought that God was so disgusted with me that I didn't think I could come to him. I was so disgusted with myself that I couldn't imagine that God would want anything to do with me. And maybe that's not the case of many of you here today, but you may know people that feel that way, that God is so disgusted with them that how could they come? You know, Pastor Derek and I was talking uh, about this message uh, earlier this week, and, and he was certainly aware of some of the things there. People say, oh, I, 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 I can't come to church. I can't come to church. I mean, what would people think of me? What would God think of me? Oh, God wouldn't want anything to do with me. My life is so uh, incredibly messed up. And, and, and we've experienced it, but that's, that's how people are kept away from God. But you know what? Even amongst believers, even amongst believers, have you ever thought, you know, I've let, that, I've let God down again. I've got to get my life cleaned up before I go to God and back again. Why would God want anything to do with me? I just don't measure up. And unfortunately, when those thoughts get deep in our hearts, they keep us from wanting to approach God. They do. And unfortunately, we're the ones who miss out. So I want to talk to you just a little bit this morning about how you can experience the God who enlarges hearts. I want you to take your Bible this morning and turn to the book of Luke because had this story not been in the Bible, many of us might be very afraid to come to God. And as you're getting to Luke chapter 7, I want to show you a picture. It's actually a drawing. And this will help you to understand the story that uh, is, has been recorded here. This is a sketch of how individuals in Jesus' day and age would eat meals when our Bible says they reclined at table. What would happen is there would be a large centralized table. There would be mats on the ground. I've seen some pictures of this that actually had a raised platform. But they would lay on their side with their head to the table and with one hand or arm available to reach the food or the drink. In fact, the passage that we are going to see, it talks about Jesus having a meal. Literally in the Greek, it says, and Jesus reclined at table in this Pharisee's home. And that's the way they would have been eating this meal together. When you see this picture, it will help you to understand how what took place was able to take place. So in your Bibles this morning, Luke chapter 7 Starting in the 36th verse. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. Now that's our modern translation of what the Greek would be. That's the way we would understand it. But literally it says, and Jesus went and reclined at the table. He went there to eat. There was a large table set up with all of the invited guests. Servants were waiting on people. I've uh, read some of the historical context of this, and at a, at a gathering of this nature, other people sometimes would come when you, when you would have a guest like this. They weren't there for the meal, but they would stand around the outside of the room just to hear the conversation. And so there were other people in and out. There were servants, but around the table were those who were invited to eat, Jesus being one of them. Now, remember the man that I told you about who shared his testimony about being so disgusted with himself and so certain that God was disgusted with him that God would not have anything to do with him. Well, I think this woman that we're going to read about probably felt the exact same way. 
very disgusted with herself, very disgusted with life, probably feeling that God would not want anything to do with her. However, she took a risk. I am so excited that she took a risk. Because had she not taken a risk, this man would not have known how God responds to people who think their life is disgusting. So let's read. Starting again in verse 36, follow along with me. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him, so Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard that he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. And when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She is a sinner. She knew what her, what her life was like. So did everyone else from that town in the room. In fact, there might have been a collective gasp when she walked in. But there certainly was a response when, again, as Jesus is reclined and his his feet are out, she knelt down at his feet and started to weep. A woman so disgusted with her life, not knowing what to do, but she takes a risk. She takes a risk that this rabbi, this Jesus she had heard about, somehow might receive her. Going back to verse 39. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. I love this next line. and I like the way the New Living translates this. Uh, it, in the literal Greek, it just said, and, and Jesus answered, But I like the new living because I think it catches the essence of it. Then Jesus answered his thoughts. Jesus answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other, but neither of them could repay him, so he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. What do you, who do you suppose loved him more after that? So he just told them an, a story, an analogy. He made this up more than likely about two individuals, one 500 silver pieces. That's 500 days wages. A silver piece in those days was 500 days wages. So basically 365 days a year, how many work days they had. It's about two years worth of wages. The other 50 days wages, again, two months. Two years, two months. He forgave them both. Now, who do you suppose would love him more after that? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. Well, that's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman, but he said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. Now, I don't know how awkward this felt in that culture, but I'll tell you what, if I'm sitting down for a meal, and I've got somebody down there kissing my feet, that is going to make me feel real awkward. Yet Jesus didn't stop her didn't even seem to be taken aback by this. You neglected, verse 46, you neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love, but a person who has forgiven little shows only little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, Your sins are forgiven. 
the men at the table said amongst themselves, who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? And Jesus said this to the woman, and I, I want you to think about it. This is an immoral woman, a woman who walked into this room disgusted with her life, wondering what was going to happen. Was she going to be kicked out? Was she going to be rebuked? Was the master going to refuse her, uh, her tears? Or I don't think she planned. I really don't think she planned on weeping. She planned because it said she specifically brought the perfume. She planned on anointing him. But I don't think she planned on weeping. I don't think she planned necessarily on kissing his feet. But when she got there and her tears started to stream, and if you've ever seen a drop of water hit something that is very dusty, it's very obvious where it is. It could be a sidewalk at your home. It could be something. And, and when, when water, just a few drops come, well, her tears, it was very obvious that his feet had not been washed. And as her tears hit his feet... Of course, maybe she was embarrassed about that, so she, she wanted to wipe them with what was ever available. She used her hair, getting the dust and the tears off of his feet. Then she came to do what she do, and that was to anoint him, but she didn't anoint him on his head. She just kissed and anointed his feet. And then Jesus says this to her, a woman who came in disgusted with her life, so demoralized, so down. Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. A heart enlarged at that moment. In that moment that Jesus did not reject her, in that moment that Jesus spoke to the, spoke to the Pharisee, rebuking him for how he was responding to that woman, and then he says, your sins are forgiven, your faith has saved you, go in peace. That's the God who enlarges hearts. I don't know the man's full story. I only heard it uh, on a podcast as he was sharing his testimony. But at the time when he was disgusted with himself and felt that God was disgusted with him, he was invited to go to a church. He was invited to go to a place where he heard for the first time the clear message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, where he heard about the forgiveness of Jesus even in his disgusted state, something that was preached that day, I don't know what it might have been. I don't know if it was this passage. It could have been any of the passages that talks about how much God loves us. He took a risk. And he responded to the invitation. And when he responded to the invitation, he did not find that God was disgusted with him. He found that God embraced him, welcomed him, and at that moment, God enlarged his heart and saved him of his sin. That's Jesus, the uplifter, the encourager, the one who enlarges our heart. When that young man in his 20s came forward, he didn't find Jesus uh, beating him down, demoralizing, demeaning him. He found Jesus lifting him up, forgiving him of his sins because we serve a God who enlarges hearts. But now I want to deal with possibly some of the objections that are going through your mind right now because a lot of times I put myself in your place. If I came to this church and I sat where you are and I preached what I just preached, just the way my mind works is going to be, but, but pastor? Of course, you're gracious and you don't raise your hand and say, but pastor, hey, what about this? So I have to, I have to assume what you might be thinking, what you might be saying. But for some of you, some of us, I've been there. You say, but pastor, when I get around God, when I get around Jesus, when I get around church folks, I don't feel enlarged, my heart. I don't feel lifted. I feel beaten down. I feel demoralized. I don't feel like I can come to God. And you may be a believer. Why is that the case? There have been times in my Christian walk where I've dropped the ball. I've failed God. I've been uh, inconsistent in my devotional life. I've gotten down. And there's something inside of me that says, oh, what does God think about this? Let me give you three things as to why this may happen. Give you three reasons why some people often feel convicted or condemned when they are around God. Put a point one this morning. If Jesus is an uplifter, why when I'm around God do I feel so convicted and condemned? Number one, you may have been given a false concept of God. 
You may have been given a false concept of God, probably as a child. I will talk to you about my false concept of God. I believed that God was always lurking in the shadows, watching my life, waiting to catch me doing something wrong so that he could punish me. That was my concept of God. So I tried to always walk on the straight and narrow. I tried to keep it all together. I walked in a religious system that said God is watching. God is keeping track. God is going to punish. That was my concept of God. And if you have a concept of God like that, it is hard to go to God. Because you just know he's going to bring up this whole list of the things you've forgotten about. And to go to him, he's going to punish you. You may have been given a false concept of God. Do you know, if you have a false concept of God, you're going to respond, you're going to live life based on the false concept of God? Let me just give you a natural illustration of this. It may, it may seem a little silly, but this was my life. And I like to talk to you about my life because I know it so well, I don't have to read it. It's not because my life is so great. I just know these stories very well. My father, and let me, let me just stop there. A lot of our concepts of God go back to childhood. My father hated power windows and power door locks. My father never would buy a vehicle with power windows and power door locks, his philosophy was it's one more thing to break down. So I never bought a vehicle with power windows or power door locks. Uh, I would have cranks come off in my hand and not be able to get the window open, but at least I didn't have those stupid power windows because it's just one more thing to break down. Till I've got power windows and power door locks for the very first time and found out that they are a gift from God. (laughs) And they don't always break down. But I had instilled in me from my childhood a false concept of power windows. Even after other people said, well, I've had power windows for years and they've never, oh, no, no, power windows, one more thing just to, just to go wrong. Probably it was the 1990s. Before I had my first vehicle and some of you are going, 1990s, I wasn't even alive then. Listen, 1990s, I had my first vehicle with power windows and power door locks and found out that they are not just one more thing to break down. They work well. So my concept changed. And when my concept changed, I began to receive the benefits of power windows and power door locks. But if you have been given a false concept of God, do you know that you will not receive some of the benefits God would have for you because you won't approach him? If you feel that God is out to get you every time that you come to him or that God is disgusted with you or that you've got to clean your life up first before going to God, it just saddens me. I had, I had individuals in my former church in the other community that said, you know, Pastor, you know, I've, I've heard about your church. Uh, I might be at a, at a, at a coffee house or, or at a restaurant or at the Rotary Club. I heard about your church. And you know what, Pastor, I'd love to, um, I'd love to attend your church. You know, I might have made an invitation, but, but, you know, the roof would fall in if I came in. And I said, well, actually, we built it pretty well. Why don't you give it a chance, you know, trying to. Uh, but, but they said, you know, maybe, maybe someday I will, but I've got to get my life right First, how many people are kept out of the presence of God because they've got to get their life, life right first? You may have been given a false concept of God or number two. It's not God, it's the enemy who makes you feel condemned. Do you know that your enemy, the devil, wants nothing more than to keep you from approaching a God who wants to touch you, to meet your needs, to fill you with the things that God wants. So he's going to whisper in your ear, probably started in a child. I think that's where a lot of people, first of all, it's a false concept of God, but then the enemy starts to feed that false concept of God. Oh, you you, you can't go to that church. What What would people say? You know that woman? She walked into a room of people that knew her past, who have probably scorned her on the streets, I'm sure that Pharisee probably walked on the other side of the street or just 
snooty when he was around her because she was an immoral woman, which meant more than likely she was very sexually immoral. Oh, and that Pharisee, he, he, no, he wouldn't have anything to do with that. For her, first of all, to walk into his house. Had Jesus not been there, she would not have. Because she knew what she'd get from him. But she had heard about this Jesus. She heard that he was a man from God. She heard that he could do miracles. And maybe she had heard that some people who came to him were welcomed. And she took a chance. She took a risk. And she walked in to anoint him. But ended up washing his feet. Kissing his feet. Anointing him. And walking out with her heart enlarged. Sometimes it's not God, it's the enemy who makes you feel condemned. He wants to keep you down. He doesn't want you fulfilling all that God would have for you. You know, the Bible says that the devil can appear as an angel of light. You know, he can sometimes sound like God. You know, he can sound really good in what he's telling you, but it's still a lie. Do you know what God feels about you? Do you know about God's love for you and how free it is? Pastor, when I'm around God, I always feel so convicted and condemned. Well, it might be because you have a false concept of God. It might be you feel this way because the devil is making you feel condemned. Number three, you may feel this way because actually it is God that is convicting you. You may feel this way because actually it is God that is convicting you. Now notice, I specifically chose those words. The devil will make you feel condemned, but Jesus will make you feel convicted. You may feel this way that you can't approach God because God is convicting you. He is dealing with something and you're feeling that conviction. People of God, hear me. If you've, if you've zoned out, I know it's been a busy weekend. If you've zoned out, everybody right now, listen. You cannot live knowingly in sin and also consistently feel the enlarging and uplifting of God. Hear what I just said. You cannot consistently live knowingly in sin and also feel the uplifting of God because you're in disobedience. Your heart knows you're in disobedience. You get close to the Spirit of God. You get close to the things of God. And there's a conviction that comes upon you. And it doesn't mean God doesn't want to lift you up. God doesn't want to encourage you. But you can't live knowingly in sin and expect that every time you're around God, your heart is going to be enlarged or uplifted because the Holy Spirit wants you to deal with that which you are saying no to. And He wants to do it so that He can lift you. He can encourage you. When you respond properly, the end result is always that your heart is enlarged. The man who came to that church feeling disgusted with himself, thinking that God wouldn't have anything to do with him, when he prayed and asked Jesus to come into his heart, he left that church feeling free and loved. The woman who came to Jesus left forgiven, She left loved, she left affirmed in front of the religious leaders. When you respond properly, and the end result is that you still feel condemned and inflated. Now, now hear this next statement. If you've responded properly to the conviction of God through repentance, and you still feel condemned after that, somebody needs to hear this. When you've responded properly to the conviction of the Holy Spirit and you still feel condemned and inflated, or deflated, not inflated, that you still feel condemned and deflated, this is a good indication that the feelings are coming from the devil or from your false concept of God. Because when you respond properly to God and you receive His forgiveness, you come in repentance, He lifts. The devil would like to tell you, well, no, he wouldn't have forgiven that. Or, uh, no, you can't, no. That's where you need to stand firm and hold fast. Because when you've responded properly to the conviction of God, your heart should be at peace. But if you still feel condemned, then the devil is beating up on you or your false concept of God is holding you
the team would begin to make their way to the platform. Early this morning as I was reviewing what I was going to share, I felt the Holy Spirit drop something in my heart that is a little different than where we've gone so far. I don't know who this is for, but please listen. Somebody has walked in here, now there's more than one. And what you say to yourself more often than not our words something like this, I'll never measure up. I'm saved. I know I'm going to heaven. I know my sins are forgiven, but I will never measure up. I read the Bible. I hear preaching. I look at what God wants. I will not measure up to what God wants. I just want to speak to you this morning that the reason that you probably feel you'll never measure up is you have been given, you've accepted a false concept of God. You need to understand what the Bible says about you, and you need to start coming against those thoughts. The Bible says you're more than a conqueror. If someone who's more than a conqueror, a person who doesn't measure up in God's sight, the Bible says you're a child of the king. Do Children of the king not measure up in God's sight. This morning, please understand. The Bible already declares that you are more than a conqueror. The Bible declares that the Spirit of God is living in you. And when the Holy Spirit comes, He comes with power. The devil has got you living at a level below where God would have you to live because He has told you that you can't measure up. And today, you need to resist and stand against it. God loves you. He embraces you. Yes, you're not perfect, and neither am I. But God wants you to come into his presence and to feel him as the uplifter, the affirmer, the encourager. As he pours his love and his grace on you, you should be able to walk out feeling different. Little boy said, you know, Grandma, the reason I like coming here is that when I come here and I leave, my heart feels full. This morning, maybe you walked in here and your heart didn't feel full of the grace of God. I pray that you would leave differently. As you've heard the truth from the Scripture, as we're going to sing a couple of songs now which reaffirm the grace, the goodness, the mercy, and the love of God. He wants to fill your heart today. He wants to come against the false concepts. He wants to come against the enemy. And He also wants to forgive if the reason that your heart doesn't feel full is because there's something standing in the way. Would you stand? I pray, Lord, Lord, this woman left your presence changed. She left your presence forgiven. She left your presence affirmed. She left your presence feeling that she could have a future and a hope. She left your presence cleansed from all unrighteousness. She came in with head bowed, weeping. She left with head held high, face glowing. Lord, for one who may have walked in today, for maybe several who walked in today feeling that way, may your spirit touch them. And may they leave this place with head held high and a sense of your love for them. You follow the team in worship this morning. You've been listening to a message from Columbus First Assembly. We hope that you've been encouraged in your spiritual journey. If you're not part of a local church and would like to attend one of our regular services, our church is located at the corner of 10th and Iowa Street in Columbus, Indiana. 
Our Sunday morning worship services start at 10 a.m. and our Wednesday evening studies begin at 7 p.m. And while you're online, check out our website at columbusfirstassembly.org for details and information about our church. You will also find other messages and series that you can listen to or download. Thanks for spending some time with us and for taking advantage of this resource from Columbus First Assembly, where we strive to learn and live the word and ways of God.